presentation explores the many interrelated issues that affect the management of human resources, employee rights, HR policies, and discipline. Employees come to work with some rights, but their rights at work are further influenced by HR policies and rules established by the employer. Let's take a closer look. Rights are powers, privileges, and interests derived from the law, nature, or tradition. Of course, defining a right presents considerable potential for disagreement. For example, does an employee have the right to privacy of communication in personal matters when using the employer's computer on company time? Moreover, legal rights may or may not correspond with certain moral rights, with open rights up to controversy and lawsuits. Statutory rights are the result of specific laws or statutes passed by federal, state, or local governments. Various laws have guaranteed employees certain work rights, such as equal employment opportunity, collective bargaining, and workplace safety. These laws and their interpretations have also been the subjects of a considerable number of court cases because employers also have rights. We call this case law. Rights are offset by responsibilities, which are obligations to perform certain tasks and duties. Employment is a reciprocal relationship in which both the employer and the employee have rights and obligations. For example, if an employee has the right to a safe working environment, then the employer must have an obligation to provide that safe workplace. If the employer has the right to expect uninterrupted, high-quality work from the employee, then the worker has the responsibility to be on the job and meet job performance standards. The reciprocal relationship of these rights and responsibilities suggests that both parties in the employment relationship should ideally regard the other as having rights and should treat the rights of others with respect. When individuals become employees, they encounter both employment rights and responsibilities. These items can be spelled out formally in a written employment contract or, more likely, in employer handbooks and policies disseminated to employees. Contracts formalize the employment relationship. For instance, when hiring an independent contractor or a consultant, an employer should use a contract to spell out the work to be performed, expected timelines, parameters, and costs and fees to be incurred. An employee's contractual rights are based on specific contracts with the employer. For instance, a union and an employer may agree on a labor contract that specifies certain terms, conditions, and rights that employees who are represented by the union have with the employer. The contract also identifies employers agreed upon actions and restrictions. Employment at will is a common law doctrine stating that employers have the right to hire, fire, demote, or promote whomever they choose unless there's a law or contract to the contrary. Conversely, employees can quit whenever they want to to go to another job. An employment at will statement in an employee handbook usually contains wording such as the following. This handbook is not a contract, expressed or implied, guaranteeing employment for any specific duration. Although we hope that your employment relationship with us will be long-term, either you or the employer may terminate this relationship at any time, for any reason, with or without cause or notice. National restrictions on employment at will include prohibitions against the use of race, age, sex, national origin, religion, and disabilities as a basis for termination. Restrictions on other areas vary from state to state. Nearly all states have enacted one or more statutes to limit an employer's right to discharge employees. Also, numerous states allow employees to file breach of contract lawsuits because of certain provisions in employee handbooks. The courts have recognized certain rationale for hearing employment at will cases. The three key areas are as follows. The public policy exception. This exception to employment at will holds that employees can sue if fired for a reason that violates public policy. For example, if an employee refused to commit perjury and was fired, the employee can sue the employer. The next is implied contract. This exception to employment at will holds that employees should not be fired as long as they perform their jobs. Lawn service, promises of continued employment, and lack of criticism of job performance imply continued employment. And finally, the good faith or fair dealing exception. This exception to employment at will suggests that a covenant of good faith and fair dealing exists between employers and at will employees. 
If an employer breaks this covenant by unreasonable behavior, the employee may seek legal recourse. Over the past several decades, many state courts have revisited and revised the employment at will contractual components. Some courts have placed limits on this doctrine, including situations when employee, employers can harmfully act towards workers. Employers that run afoul of employment at will restrictions may be guilty of wrongful discharge, which is the termination of an individual's employment for reasons that are illegal or improper. Employers can take several precautions to reduce wrongful discharge liabilities. Having a well-written employee handbook Training managers and maintaining adequate documentation are key. A landmark court case in wrongful discharge was Fortune versus National Cash Register Company. The case involved the firing of a salesperson, Mr. Fortune, who had been with National Cash Register or NCR for 25 years. The employee's termination came shortly after he got a large customer order that would have earned him a big commission. Based on the evidence, the course concluded that he was wrongfully discharged because NCR dismissed him to avoid paying the commission, thus violating the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Given the increase in wrongful discharge lawsuits based on different interpretations of the law, companies are much more concerned today about potential litigation in this area. Closely related to wrongful discharge is constructive discharge, which is deliberately making conditions intolerable to get an employee to quit. Under normal circumstances, an employee who resigns rather than being dismissed cannot later collect damages for violation of legal rights. An exception to this rule occurs when the courts find that the working conditions were made so intolerable as to force a reasonable employee to resign. Then the resignation is considered a constructive discharge. Dangerous duties, insulting comments, and failure to provide reasonable work are examples of actions that can lead to a claim of constructive discharge. Just cause is reasonable justification for taking employment-related action. The need for a good reason for disciplinary actions, such as termination, usually are found in union contracts, but not in all at-will situations. Even though definitions of just cause vary, the overall concern is fairness. To be viewed by others as just, any disciplinary action must be based on facts in an individual case. Violations of these requirements can result in legal action. For instance, a court could easily rule that a high-performing worker was not fired for just cause if he had been terminated for poor performance after taking unpaid time off associated with the Family Medical Leave Act to help a sick relative. Due process, like just cause, is about fairness. Due process is the requirement that the employer use a fair process to determine if there has been employee wrongdoing and that the employee has the opportunity to explain and defend his or her actions. Oftentimes, this requires a company to properly investigate the reasons for personnel decisions and to give individuals an opportunity to express their concerns to unbiased reviewers of the situation in question. Organizational justice is a key part of due process. This figure shows some factors that should be considered when combining an evaluation of just cause and due process. How HR managers address these factors determines whether the courts perceive employers' actions as fair. HR policies, procedures, and rules greatly affect employees' rights that we just discussed and discipline, which we'll discuss next. When there's a choice among actions, policies act as a general guideline to help focus an organization's actions. Policies are general in nature, whereas procedures are, and rules are specific to a situation. The important role of all three requires that they be reviewed regularly. As we just discussed, procedures provide customary methods of handling activities and are more specific than policies. For an example, a policy may state that employees will be given vacations according to years in service, and a procedure establishes a specific method for authorizing vacation time without disrupting work. And finally, in our discussion of employee rights and responsibilities, let's look at pro progressive discipline. Progressive discipline incorporates steps that become progressively more significant and are designed to change the employee's inappropriate behavior. This figure shows a typical progressive discipline process. 
the most progressive discipline procedures use verbal and written reprimands and suspension before resorting to termination. For example, at a manufacturing firm, an employee's failure to call in when being absent from work might lead to a suspension without pay after the third offense in a year. Supervision sends employees a strong message that undesirable job behaviors must change or termination is likely to follow. Following the progressive sequence ensures that both the nature and the seriousness of the problem are clearly communicated to the employee. Not all steps in a progressive discipline procedure are followed in every case. Certain serious offenses are exempted from the progressive discipline approach and may result in immediate termination. Typical offenses leading to immediate termination include intoxication at work, alcohol or drug use at work, fighting, theft, and so on. However, if a firm has a written progressive discipline policy, it should be followed when immediate termination is not appropriate because failing to do so can cause an employee's dismissal to be considered outside the normal disciplinary process.